JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a host to many great supporting characters in its long 30-year run. Well, except for these two parts. Though some do end up being more memorable than others, it usually depends on the impact the character leaves on the world. And one of the most memorable characters in all of JoJo is the Frenchman with passion in his heart and a blade at his hip, Jean-Pierre Polnareff. So tarot cards have played an important role in the overall character design in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, especially during Stardust Crusaders. Not only were characters having their stands named after the tarot cards, but the characters themselves would reflect characteristics of the card's meaning. And this is made especially clear with Polnareff and the Chariot Arcana, as Polnareff himself even points out this connection. Though before we get into that, we should actually understand where the Jean-Pierre Polnareff name comes from. So, Araki said in Jejonium Volume 16 that when he was designing Polnareff's name, he knew he wanted the character to be French, so he thought of his three favorite Frenchmen. About the name Jean-Pierre Polnareff, my three favorite French people are Alain Delon, Jean-Paul Balmondo, and the singer-songwriter Michael Polnareff. So I was influenced by their names. And back then, the first French name that came to mind was Jean-Paul. So let's break down these three influences on Polnareff's name. So first is the name Jean which the first name is probably credited to Jean-Paul Belmondo, given that Jean-Paul was the first name that Araki could think of, he kept the Jean part. Also given the fact that Jean is such a common name in France. But Belmondo was a big French actor in the 60s, 70s, and then the 80s. And in the 80s, Belmondo actually worked closely with the person who inspired the Pierre in Polnareff's name. That person being Alain Delon, which may sound strange at face value, so let me explain. You see, Delon is best known for working with a director named Jean-Pierre Melville, and some people even refer to Delon as the definitive Melvillean actor. So, when you think of Delon, you might also find yourself thinking about Jean-Pierre Melville. It's a lot like how Bruce Campbell is very connected to Sam Raimi in a way. That is a more American idea of what I'm talking about. Now, Melville is best known for his works on minimalistic film noir are crime dramas, some examples being Le Samurai and Le Circle Rouge, and both of these movies star Delon. So this is probably the most likely place where Araki got the, the Pierre in Jean-Pierre Polnareff, as it plays off of his original idea of Jean-Paul while maintaining its own uniqueness. Then finally we have Michael Polnareff. Michael Polnareff is a French singer-songwriter who, like the rest of these people, were hugely popular in the 60s and the 70s, but unlike everyone else, they fell off really badly during the 70s, only to return to popularity in the 90s. So, some influences found on Jean-Pierre Polnareff, the character from Michael Polnareff the Musician, is that Polnareff the Musician is well known in his earlier career for experimenting with his styles. He wrote songs in genres such as folk rock, psychedelic pop, pop, jazz, and just regular rock. So he has a very colorful musical career. Though one of the largest influences I can find on Jean-Pierre Polnareff is the real history of Michael Polnareff. You see, both the character and the musician suffer from a sudden loss of a close family member. Michael Polnareff loses his mother, where Jean-Pierre Polnareff loses his sister. Both of these losses found the two leaving France in search of something to ease their suffering. Michael Polnareff went to America, where Jean-Pierre was hunting down Jay Gaille. And then lastly, a small connection, but one that has Jojo mirror reality. Both Jean-Pierre Polnareff and Michael Polnareff return home to France on the same year, that year being 1989, with both of them overcoming their hardships. Then in the late 90s, specifically 1998, Polnareff, the singer-songwriter, would return to popularity as some of his old songs were being picked up and used as themes for other things. Specifically, We Will All Go to Paradise, a song that was used by Restaurants de Cure, which is a charity which provides the needy with the essentials they need for life, such as a warm meal and a place to stay. This is also reflected by Araki in the exact same year, 1998, bringing Polnareff back into the main story of Part 5, as he debuts in August of 1998. He, as a character, is used to deliver the protagonists the tools they need to defeat Diavolo. He is bringing something to the needy. So, Polnareff the musician has a long-lasting effect on Polnareff the character. 
Another thing that impacted the character of Polnareff was his Chariot Tarot card. Polnareff was assigned the Chariot either by his own accord or by Dio when Dio was acting as a fortune teller. Either way, the card which Polnareff represents early on is the Reverse Chariot Tarot. The Reverse Chariot describes a person who has lost control of their life and feels themselves guided by an external force. They are also prone to horrible, rash decision making and they are overfilled with confidence. In the case of Polnareff, the external force that is pushing Polnareff down the path that he is going is Dio and Jay Guile. They control Polnareff's decisions through most of the early half of Stardust Crusaders, and even after Jotaro and his crew cure Polnareff of his brainwashing, he is still the reverse chariot because his reformation wasn't purely on his own choice, but based on his duty to the Crusaders, and he still has the external force of Jay Gal guiding him. This is seen in Polnareff's behavior during the Devil Fight, repeatedly falling victim to his enemy's traps and only coming out on top based on pure luck. Then, as the real force that guides him appears again, he makes an irrational decision to leave the Crusaders in search of Jay Guile on his own. This action to abandon the Crusaders appears to cost Polnareff his friend Avdol's life, though Avdol survives because bullshit, but in the loss of Polnareff's friends, he finds himself taking control over his life back. This realization that the Crusaders is where he belongs gives him purpose enough to allow Kakyoin to help him as they overcome Jay Guile. In this triumph, he's able to take his reverse chariot and turn it back to an upright chariot, as the upright chariot represents conquest, victory, and overcoming the opposition through your own confidence and control. He fully takes control of his life back from Jay Guile and from Dio. He then takes this upright chariot with him through all of part 3 and into his character and personality in part 5. Because you see, part 5 is a whole new tarot reading compared to part 3. Because of this, when the upright chariot appears again, the chariot carries new meaning. This new meaning says that the person should tread cautiously and utilize any newly acquired power or discipline with care. Yada yada, great power, great responsibility. The Chariot also mentions imparting a great balance to the world. This could easily be seen as Polnareff being in possession of the special arrow, this arrow being the one that creates Requiems, is the power that Polnareff needs to handle with care, and then having to bestow this information and this arrow onto Passion is what creates a balance between Passion and Diavolo. Though if there was ever a moment when Polnareff was coming close to turning from the upright back to the reverse, it was during the Judgment Fight. Polnareff makes a deal with a Jinn, or the Judgment Stand, to bring people back from the dead. In doing this, Polnareff is unable to handle the consequences of his decision, and these consequences begin to physically damage Polnareff. He slowly begins to tilt back into the reverse again, until the real Avdol returns and makes Polnareff realize he doesn't need to live a life filled with regrets. This fully cements Polnareff's placement as the Upright Chariot, and this is why, of all the events and fights in Part 3, the one that that Polnareff remembers as his body dies in part 5 is the judgment as it was such a major memory for him. Another interesting detail about the Chariot Arcana is that it is sometimes referred to as the Victory Arcana. In this version of the card, it depicts a picture of the Archangel Shemael, whose name literally means he who sees God. Shemael also assists people in finding strength and courage to face adversity when it seems they have none left. These two factors play into major moments for Polnareff as a character during the two parts that he appears in, the first being him encountering Dio before everyone else in the mansion. This makes Polnareff the one who sees God, as Dio literally means God in Italian. This scene also is important as it paints Dio as a very powerful being such as a god and shows off to the reader his ability for the first time. We also get the stand's name and its design. Then you have Shamael assisting people in their time of need, which is Polnareff's purpose in part 5. Which is why these two major scenes for Polnareff actually mirror each other. As you see, they are both scenes involving Polnareff, a main villain, and a stairway. In fact, they almost look exactly the same if you put them next to each other and just swap the two characters. But it shows differences in power between Polnareff in Part 3 and Polnareff in Part 5. Speaking of Polnareff's purpose during parts, let's discuss his use in both Stardust Crusaders and Golden Wind. Araki describes Polnareff's use in Part 3 as, When you think about characters who grew the most on their journey to defeat Dio, the first one who comes to mind is Polnareff. He went from a lone wolf who only cared about getting revenge for his sister to one of the allies who supported the Joestar group to the end. It was a lot of fun to draw his growth through his stand battles and on his way to Egypt. For better or for worse, Polnareff's lines always stand out, so the readers may think he gets a lot of screen time. Jotaro is the main character and of course Joseph is the navigator. 
Polnareff was the best answer I could come up with for a personality and visual appearance that would be able to stand uniquely apart from those two. He makes up for what the two Joestars can't do. So, in a sense, Polnareff was being written as more of a main character than the rest of the supporting cast. Araki would always struggle also with whether or not he would kill Polnareff off. He always threw him at do-or-die situations, as you see with most of his stand fights, which is what plays into him being one of the three survivors. He was the silly foil to Jotaro's emotionless appearance, and and also the serious side to Joseph's goofy antics. He was the perfect middle ground for a character. This is why, like the other two survivors of the Crusade, Polnareff goes on to be a mentor to a new crew. Joseph was the mentor to the Crusaders. Jotaro became the mentor to the Moriocho boys. Polnareff became the mentor to the Pachione gangsters. He also becomes their second in command, because two is too close to four. Now design-wise, I feel Polnareff is very simple. He dresses for combat and nothing more. Though the most noticeable detail about him is his earrings, which is a broken heart, which symbolizes the burden he bears from the death of his sisters and possibly later on the death of his friends. Then you have his hair, which Araki claims to be inspired by an earlier character of Von Stroheim, and he only kept it around due to how imposing and iconic it looked when the character was just a silhouette. He also pointed out that it was also fun to draw, which is one of the reasons why he used Polnareff so often. Though, these design ideas can also be seen in another character who I feel greatly inspired the whole character of Jean-Pierre Polnareff, and that being Anigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. Now looking at both of these characters, you'll notice that they have very similar ideas in their design and their use in their story. As you see, Anigo's design isn't that overly complex or fancy compared to characters like the Dread Pirate Roberts or the Six-Fingered Man. These designs have a silliness aspect to them as well, as Anigo's long hair and mustache makes him appear as goofy as Polnareff with his ridiculously high-standing hair. Then you also have both of these characters are very skilled swordsmen, and they both implement some sort of misdirect in their first battle, where Polnareff reveals that Silver Chariot's armor is removable and makes it faster, and also mid-fight when Inigo reveals that he's fighting with his offhand the entire time. Then you have both characters turning from enemy to ally. This is very simple and done a lot of, in a lot of stories, but they're also both looking for a man with a deformed hand. You see Inigo's looking for the man with six fingers on his right hand that killed his father, where Polnareff is looking for a man with two right hands that killed his sister. When they meet this deformed man, they chase after them desperately, and when they finally catch them, they become a victim of a thrown dagger. Though this dagger is ineffective, and Polnareff and Inigo both call out dramatically their reason and intent for vengeance before killing their rivals. <laughs> They also, after that point, take on more fancy identities, with Inigo becoming the Dread Pirate Robert and Polnareff becoming the Guardian of the Arrow. Fun little fact, a character named Pierre actually takes up the title of Dread Pirate after Wesley instead of Inigo. So, in the movie it's Inigo, and in the book it's a character named Pierre. I just thought that'd be, that'd be fun to mention because of the obvious Jean-Pierre Polnareff. Polnareff is one of the best supporting characters in the whole of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, if not the best. He had a perfect blend of humor, seriousness, and lovability. And his stands are a whole video in and of themselves. And yes, I said stands. That's a, that's a whole different topic. But if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it in the future, please head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash manynotthebadguy. $3 or more gives you the ability to vote in the monthly It Just Works poll, which is a poll for the next It Just Works that I will do monthly. I have like specific characters up there, so if you wanna vote for one that you want, then head on over there and do it there. And if you are on a quest to find your own six-fingered man, I heard that you can find their location at Funimation.com slash show slash Shimonetta, Boring World where the concept of dirty jokes doesn't exist, or at Amazon.com with Shimonetta, Boring World where the dirty jokes doesn't exist. And you buy a DVD, and it comes, it's like a map. It's like, you literally, you literally open up the map, it's like, there's your six-fingered man, and you can go, you get him. You don't even have to train. You just go get them. Throw copies of Chimonetta at them. Buy like a hundred and just throw them. That's your new weapon. It's my stand.